Testing one, two. Can you all hear me? Yes. All right, good. Let me go ahead and say happy Sabbath to everyone. Sabbath. Very, very thankful to have you all here. Always grateful to be here at Open Door, where by the grace of God, we can hear the Lord speak directly to our hearts. And uh, I have no doubt that God has a message for us this afternoon or morning, still morning. So let's go ahead and let's prepare our hearts to receive the word. I'm going to kneel to do that. And if you'd like to join me in kneeling, you can kneel with me. Otherwise, just bow your heads reverently where you are. Let's all pray together at this time. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for these opportunities where we can come together and worship you in spirit and in truth. We're grateful, Lord, for these privileges to live in a land still with freedom that we can honor you with our lives and worship you openly and be unashamed of the gospel. Lord, we know these days sooner or later, for many of us who understand prophecy, it's coming much more sooner, that we will not enjoy these privileges as we do now. And so, Lord, help us to cherish these moments. Give us what we need at this time and open our eyes, Father, I pray, and help us behold wondrous things out of your law, we ask. We pray for the forgiveness of our sins and the anointing of your Holy Spirit to enable us to have the mind of Christ. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. We do not have a PowerPoint today as far as the screen is concerned, but we're going to ask God for power as he points us to the scripture. Amen. And I'd like to invite you to turn your Bibles with me to the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. And I want us to go ahead and take a look at something that I believe is the Christian's hope. It's such a beautiful passage of scripture. I'm going to ask that we all can read it together. We're going to look at John 14 and we're going to consider verses 1 to 3. John 14 and we're considering verses 1 to 3. When you get there, just simply let me know by saying amen. amen. The Bible says in John 14, starting at verse 1. It says, let not your heart be troubled. As a matter of fact, let's read it together. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. This is the Christian's hope. The Christian puts all their weight on this promise. That no matter how bad the world gets, we know a better day is coming. We know that a time is coming where Jesus is going to burst through the clouds of glory. And he is going to come and claim his people back in his arms. And the Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. The gospel really is good news. It really is. Because if there's one thing that both the worldly and the religious can agree on is that our world is in trouble. There are problems galore. And the problems seem to be growing and they're not getting any better. And everyone, sooner or later, when there's a lot of problems in our world, we always look forward to the day of deliverance. We look forward to the solution to the problems. And this is one of the reasons why God allows problems. You see, the Apostle Paul said it like this. He said, if you then be risen with Christ, then seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Then he says, set your affections on things above. Now, Sometimes that's a challenge. It's a challenge if we got a lot going on on earth, sometimes it's hard for us to set our affections on things above. When we are privileged to make good money, when we're privileged to have good prestigious businesses or positions at a company, or if we just find ourselves having a little bit more abundance, then you start to set your affections on things of earth. We begin to look forward to the next house, the next car, the next clothing item, the next thing that we can do, the next vacation, or whatever it may be. If we are prospering often, we will set our affections on the very opposite of what God tells us to. 
But the Lord says, no, I don't want you to set your affections on things of earth. I want you to set it on things above. And this is why God sometimes allows trials. This is why God sometimes allows some drama to come into our lives, because he wants us to remember this world is not our home. This is even why sometimes the Lord allows sickness to come upon our lives is to help us look that much more the forward to the day when finally there will be not only no more death, but there'll be no more sickness. You see, God allows things to take place in our lives so that we can set our focus, recalibrate, get back to the main things of what we are to believe and to function on as children of God. This is why that second coming of Jesus means everything to the child of God. Because we know that a better day is coming, no matter how bad it is. And the truth of the matter is, is even if you think you got it going on, I mean, brothers and sisters, let's just keep it this way. Even if you're able to get a Tesla Model S Plaid, a really, really fast car, do you understand that I will leave that car in the dust with my wings? Are you following? In other words, when Jesus comes and when all things are made new, even the nicer things of life will pale in comparison to that which God has prepared for his children. And so even if we are in abundance, God says there's something better that is coming along. Certainly, if we are lacking, then there's definitely more that we can look forward to. Now, when the disciples received this message, you remember what Jesus told them to do. Jesus, when he made this promise, I will come again, he then said, now go, tell everybody this good news. Tell everybody about the reality that I have ascended into the sanctuary above to intercede on their behalf, to minister, and that one day I'm coming again. So you know what the disciples did? They began to believe it, and they began to share it. And you know what they got? Persecution. When you study the book of Acts very carefully, they lived in a godless world. They lived in a world that was very anti-Christ. They lived in a world that did not look forward to John 14 coming to pass. They lived in a world that actually wanted to hold off John 14 as long as possible. And so while God gave us a good news message, when we gave it to the world at large, they took offense to it. The cross, while it is beautiful in all of its impact, in all of its glory, to the unconverted heart, the cross was offensive. The cross was something nobody wanted to hear. And when they heard it, they found it to be very offensive. And the reason why this is so important for us to understand is back in the days, in the days of the apostles, to be a Christian was actually an unpopular thing. During those days, there was persecution. During those days, there was tremendous suffering. During those days, there was martyrdom. To be a Christian, if a person called themselves a Christian, you knew more than likely, with exceptions, they were the real deal. Because it was not a popular thing to be a follower of Christ in the days of the apostles. Had a good news message. But in that good news message, It also said something else. You see, go to Matthew chapter 1. You see, the disciples were not commissioned to go and to tell everybody, Jesus is coming again, and he's going to take us home with him forever. It was not that simple. You see, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 1, in Matthew, the first chapter, there was a context to the giving of this gospel message about Christ's coming. And it's imperative that you and I get this because I'm about to drop some meat on us today and I want us to be prepared to digest it. In Matthew chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 21, if you're there, just say amen. Amen. The Bible says in Matthew 1 and verse 21, and she shall call his name Jesus, for he's going to do something special. What's he going to do? Save his people from their sins. Christ is coming back, but he's not coming back for people who are still living in their sins. He's coming back for people that have allowed him to save them from their sins. That means that sin had to be called out. That means that sin had to be dealt with. There's a lot of feel-good churches that exist today that will allow a sinner to come in hear a message, and leave emboldened in sin to go back into the world. These are very dangerous churches. 
Those type of ministers are very dangerous ministers. Jesus did not always give a message that made people feel good. Jesus actually loved people enough to give them what they needed rather than what they wanted. And so it is with all of God's qualified gospel workers in the last days, the message that we will carry. It will always have a beautiful component to it. It's always going to have a component to it that will allow the hearer to say, I like that. That sounds really nice. But there comes sooner or later a component to the gospel message that somebody's going to say, I don't like that. And if you say that again, you're going to get some consequences for that. And the reality is that when you look at the life of Jesus, I love studying the life of Jesus. I love studying the ministry of Christ. When I study the ministry of Jesus, I see this very thing. I did a sermon a long time ago that I've been decided to entitle this sermon, The John 6 Experience. That's the title of the message. Forgive me, I didn't get it to my brothers in the back. But that's our title of our message today, The John 6 Experience. When I began to study the Bible, I noticed that when Jesus entered on the scene in the, Gospels of John, in the Gospel of John, when Jesus entered the scene, he was a pretty well-received man amongst the people. In John 1, he's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That was really good news. In John chapter 2, man, he was the man who saved the couple from horrific embarrassment. He was the man that turned water into wine. Everybody loved Jesus. In John chapter 3, in John chapter 3, Jesus is so impressive that by the time you get to John chapter 3, Jesus got rabbis coming out at night trying to find out how they can be converted. By the time you get to John chapter 4, now Jesus is talking to Samaritans. The very ostracized and hated people, and here goes Christ, ministering to these very people and telling this woman who ultimately told everybody, come see a man who has told me all things that I've ever done. Is not he the Christ? When you get to John chapter 5, man, Christ does an incredible miracle and heals a man that's been sick for 38 years. And Jesus comes along and does a miracle on this man's behalf that caused many minds to marvel. It seemed like the people were heralding him. Now, there were some people that didn't like him. They were the leaders. The Pharisees did not like Christ. They were not very happy with him because he was basically taking what they felt belonged to them. Honor, prestige, popularity. But the people at large, they began to really love Jesus. They began to really like him, and they began to follow him. But by the time you get to John chapter 6, the whole game changed. And Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. Let's turn to John chapter 6. By the time you get to John the 6th chapter, we find that Jesus is now doing something. Jesus, being the compassionate son of God that he was, Jesus sees a whole bunch of people coming to hear the message, but he also knows that these people got to be hungry. He is so considerate. He sees that they're hungry and they need to eat, and so he decides to tell the disciples, tell everybody sit down, and we're going to go ahead and do a miracle. And he does a miracle, and he takes a few fish and a few loaves, and he turns it into enough to feed thousands with plenty left over. The people were so impressed. Now, by the time you get to John 6, Jesus has thousands upon thousands of followers. We would call that a successful ministry. In our worldly minds, we would call that a successful ministry. You know why I said worldly? If you look carefully at the Bible, a lot of the successful ministries appeared like failures. If you study the Bible carefully, if you look, at, think about it. Jesus is on a cross. All he has is two people at the bottom that are even recognizing him, his mother and one of his disciples. But everybody else is gone and they're all hiding. And they're all hiding because they're thoroughly ashamed of the gospel. John is there because he loves Jesus, but at the same time, John sooner or later finds himself dipping out and he even starts hiding away. So now you got one disciple dead who betrayed you, 
And then you got 11 other disciples who walked away and they are ashamed of you. And Jesus had to die all by, him, by his lonesome. If somebody would have seen the, the story of the cross up to that point, they would say, I think he was a failure. Because it didn't look like a success at all. But it was only until resurrection morning, it was only until right before the stoning of Stephen, where even several priests are now being converted. It's after the early rain fell. Now we start to see the powerful and effectual impact of the ministry of Christ. But for face value, looking at it, at first it looked like a failure. Jeremiah, at first it looks like a failure. Noah, you only got eight? Bro, you had a boat that could hold like thousands. You only get eight? That's why I said it's the worldly mind that says success in ministry is based on numbers. That's what I'm trying to get across to you is never say a ministry is successful because they have so many numbers. Numbers in and of themselves does not indicate success. I remember when I first came here to open door. You know, I don't, I don't like false humility. I think false humility is exactly that. It's false. It's fake. It's, it has no power. So I'm not, here to be, I'm, not, I'm not here to present a false humility before you. I'm not dumb. When I first came here, I told the elders and the board, I said, uh, you know a lot of people are going to start coming. You guys okay with that? And we talked about it. You know, I said, a lot of people are going to start coming. Why? Because, especially in California, we like fanfare. You know, we like fanfare. You know, if, if there's people who like a name, they're going to show up in large numbers. But from day one, I remember I prayed. I said, Father, if there are people that's coming here because all that's on their mind is to hear a good sermon from a preacher they like, may they come in and may they eventually leave. Because you can go to Audioverse and YouTube and you can hear sermons all day long from lots of other speakers as well. But I prayed, I said, Father, whoever you send here, let them be here, not because they're here, because they just got some preacher they like to hear. Let them be here because you sent them here and you laid a burden on their hearts that they are called to be workers for God in this church, whether this preacher is here or not. That was my prayer. And so what did I see in the earlier months of, of Open Door? Oh my, we, we, we were packing the house. And as time trickles on, the house is not as packed anymore. And some people actually got nervous about that. They said, oh no, it's not good. What do we do to get the people back? I was like, nothing. <laughs> nothing. Let them leave. Not that I don't have love for these people. I got nothing but love for these people. But I'm not looking for fans. I'm not looking for people who just want to hear a message and then go about their business. I'm looking for people who are going to be committed to the cause of God and that God has given them a vision to see a role that they can play in this lovely little church called Open Door. And from what I see, God is doing exactly that. Numbers in and of themselves does not make a ministry successful. Well, here it is. Jesus has big numbers. I mean, he can impress any religious organization of his day because this man got thousands upon thousands. So you know what Jesus decides to do? Jesus is going along and he's giving a good news message. He's feeding the people. He's helping them. He's doing all sorts of great things to minister unto them. But Jesus knew I got to do something. Because I know that a lot of these people are only following me for the fishes and the loaves. They're in the mindset of what they can get rather than being in the mindset of what they can give. So you know what Jesus decides to do? <laughs> the Bible says Jesus decided to say something. And I want you to see what it says. If you're in John 6, let me hear you say amen. amen. The Bible says in John 6, verse 53, in John 6 and verse 53, the Bible says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood 
dwells in me and I in him. Man, when these faithful Jewish people heard that, they was like, hold up. Did this man just tell us to eat his flesh? The book Desire of Ages says that this was a testing statement that Jesus said to them. Always remember, the devil tempts. God never tempts before, because temptation is to pull you down and make you worse. God never tempts, James 1. But God does test because every good teacher tests their students. And so Jesus was exercising his teacher right. He's testing them. He says, all right, if you're really following me, I'm going to drop something on you. and I'm going to see who's going to inquire. And so rather than them saying, Master, what do you mean by this? I'm confused. Please help me understand. Don't we do that in college? We, we, we do that with our temporal professors. When our professors say something that makes no sense and sounds almost contradictory even to our values, I don't see a bunch of us as students saying, that's it, we're getting out of here, we're going to protest, we're going to picket this whole place, and we're going to make sure nobody goes to this class after this teacher confused us. What do we do as students? We say, that makes no sense, but shh. Go ahead, teacher. And we just keep going. But this teacher comes along and says something, and these people are like, how can he tell us to eat his flesh? And so they think that Jesus is promoting cannibalism. But that was the last thing Jesus was doing. Jesus knew, I know why you're following me. You're not following me for what I can give you. You're not following me for what I came to give you. You're just following me to get your temporal blessings. And so when he threw that test out, the Bible says something. Let's look at it. The Bible says when he threw that test out, it says in verse 66, in John 6 and verse 66, the Bible says, many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a what kind of saying? You know, I'm learning that every true minister of the gospel sooner or later has a hard saying to give to the saints. You can't just always be the nice guy. You can't just always be that really sweet girl. You actually are still a nice person. You actually are still a good person. I believe that. But we have to understand that our message that God has given to prepare people for the coming of the Lord is not always going to be a message that everybody's going to welcome with open arms. And I don't care how soft-toned your voice is. You could only whisper to people. You could be like, hello, hi, how are you? You could talk as soft as you want. There comes a point, and the world is getting it. The world is getting it. There are certain groups of people today that they're going to say, look, do you believe this or do you not? And you could be like, well, you see, God is so loving. They're going to be like, look, do you believe this or do you not? The world is getting smart. They're getting past our soft tones and our kind gestures and our always, you know, we think for some reason standing straight is arrogant and bending low is humble. So, you know, sometimes we stand before people like, well, brother, see, no, no, hold on. You see, and we, and we think this posture is communicating humility. And so you, we can do all of these things, soft tone, da, da, da. The bottom line is people are going to say, look, do you believe this? And if you believe this, we are intolerant of who you are. That's the world we live in now. And so the reality is that we must accept that while it is important to speak kindly to people, it is very important, don't be rude, don't be obnoxious, but we have to understand that there's some things, no matter how kind and nice and whatever body posture we express, there's going to be some things that people are just going to say, if you believe that, just the fact that you believe that makes you public enemy number one. Amen. And so the Bible says that in verse 66, there are people who said, man, this is a hard saying. Who can bear this saying? To the point that I want you to notice the impact of the words of Christ. Like I said, every faithful minister and every faithful ministry is sooner or later going to arrive at John 6. They're going to have the John 6 experience. What's the John 6 experience? Well, let's go ahead and let's take a look. So the Bible says this, verse 66, John 6 
And verse 66, earlier I said verse 66, it was verse 60, but now we're looking at John 6, verse 66. It says, from that time, what does it say? Many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. I thought to myself, I said, how many? Now, how many people were following him? Thousands. thousands. We don't know exactly the number, but it was thousands that was following him. And it says many. Do you know that I figured out the number? I kind of got an idea of the number. One thing I know for sure about the many, it was the great grand majority. Can I prove it? Look at the next verse. In verse 67, it says, Then said Jesus unto the... How many was with him? Thousands. How many are left? Twelve. A great majority of them left them. Do you know if a pastor was preaching at a church that had thousands and then there's only twelve left? How quickly we would transition and say they were a success. But now they're a failure. Was Jesus a failure? But how many was he left with? He was left with twelve. Then, to even make it worse, look at what it says next. It says in verse 67, Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you, what? Twelve. And one of you is a devil. So he didn't even have twelve. Are you following? Now, Jesus understood the same truth that makes people free is the same truth that, can, that others will find offensive. And it's not because of your tone of voice. It's not because of the wording that you chose. It's because there are some people who refuse to break the love relationship between their hearts and sin. And anyone who comes with a message of deliverance from sin and a call to turn away, they're going to be found as very offensive, obtrusive people. Every faithful ministry is going to have a John 6 experience. Every faithful ministry, every faithful minister is going to enter into the John 6 experience where first there was nothing but love, nothing but love. But if you start telling the people what they need to hear, it's going to start causing some agitation. You're not looking for it. I get that. But beloved, and you know why the urgency is given to us to give more of that straight component of the message? Our lives are but a vapor. We don't know who's going to be here tomorrow. And so sometimes when the Lord gives us windows of opportunity to talk with people, look at, look at this ministry. We got a ministry going out next week, and of all books you're going to give out, you're going to give out The Great Controversy. Amen. And The Great Controversy causes controversy. <laughs> Isn't that right? But the reason that the saints are going out to give out Great Controversy is because they understand we're getting towards the close of it. Amen. And what we must do, we must do quickly. And therefore, we encourage people, hey, read this book, very powerful, da 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 We give our testimonies when we give it out, etc. We give it because our heavenly commander told us to give the book out. I get it. But family, don't think for a New York second, great controversy causes controversy. It causes controversy, and it's okay. Sometimes we need people to think. We need to realize something called, and this is one thing that's very lacking. I believe it with all of my heart ever since. I've been in California now since October of 2020. And I can say emphatically, by way of experience, if there's one thing we, as a people of God, are lacking thoroughly, is urgency to the times in which we're living. Hands down. I mean, like, I can say it like I got a master's degree in studying on it. It is ever so clear. We are lacking urgency in to the times in which we are living. I think we are struggling as a people believing the times in which we are living. And as a result of that, it's causing us to move with a lethargy that God wants to arouse us from it and get us on higher ground. Now, family, 
Jesus started to give this message. He gives a message and now the people are walking away from him. Do you know something else that happened to him? Go to John 7. By the time you get to John 7 now, unfortunately, look at what the Bible says next. Because again, there's no way that Christ went through this experience and we're not. If we're faithful, there's no way that Christ has gone through this experience and we're not. The Bible says in John 7, if you're there, say amen. amen. Verse 1, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to do what? Hmm. Then it says, now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, depart hence, and go unto Judea, that thy disciples, uh, that thy disciples who may see the works that thou doest, also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Now watch verses 6 and 7. It says, Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me, what did Jesus say? He says the world hates me. But me, it hates. Why did the world hate Jesus? It says, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Jesus was not the guy going around skipping everywhere and throwing flowers on people as some gospel messages present him. Jesus was a man who loved people enough to tell them the truth. He was exceptionally tactful. He was very skilled in his wording, and he was most certainly saturated with love with every single syllable and noun that came out of his mouth. But Jesus understood there's things going on in the lives of people in this world that's destroying them. And he said, and I can save them. And that, he had no time to play games with it. And so he spoke directly to their hearts. That's why even Nicodemus, oh, Lord, there's, there's no teacher who can teach as you teach and they not be sent of God. And, you know, some people would be like, you know, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Jesus bypasses all that flattery. And Nicodemus, oh, Lord, you, you're a rabbi, you're a teacher, you've got to be a teacher. And Jesus bypasses all of it and he says, Nicodemus, I'm telling you the truth. You need to be born again. Do you see that? He had such a discernment that he could see it. Do you know you and I can have that discernment? You and I can have that discernment that we can actually do that, that the Holy Spirit can tell us things and we can actually see it and say, thank you, Lord. Talk to the soul and give them what the Bible calls meat in do season. God wants us to understand that the message that he has given to us is a very deep and it's a very solemn message. It's ultimately good news, great news. But it's for those who have decided to follow him. And so the reality is, is that principle number one is God says, listen, be faithful to the message. Be faithful to the truth as it is in Jesus. Be faithful to your God. The first point that God wants us to understand in our study is God wants to say all of us are going to go through the John 6 experience. So stop trying to avoid it. It's going to come. There are going to be times that we're going to have to give hard sayings. And that hard saying doesn't mean, all right, now you got me so mad, now I'm going to hit you hard. That's not the context of a hard saying. A hard saying is simply telling the truth, knowing it's going to get some people upset no matter how nice you say it. There are things happening in our world, there are things happening in our society, and there are things that are taking place, family, and it's destroying our children. There's campaigns that this world has put on. This world wants to win our youth, especially, to the other side. They want them to see that these lifestyles that God prescribes in his word is old and ancient. Therefore, we have new lifestyles that we want you to try out. And it's on every commercial. 
It's on every television program. I can't even walk into my flight on Delta without seeing an advertisement to let me know, try the new way. And you know when a young person has no idea what their identity is? When a young person has no idea who they are or whose they are, they are the best subjects to fall prey to this worldwide, very orchestrated campaign that's happening right now. And because the church doesn't want John 6, they say nothing. And God says, all right, that's a problem. Now, the reality, family, is that if we stand for truth, we're going to undergo trials and tribulations that are completely unwanted. If we really begin to stand faithful, you know, I've had people say that to me so often, Brother Lemon, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you. I say, why are you praying for me? Oh, because, you know, if you, you stand for the things you stand for, the devil's going to attack you and your family. They were 100% correct. And when I watch how the devil has tried to attack, oh, not tried, has attacked me and my family, the people that's written on my heart, people I would die for in a New York second, wouldn't even have to think about it. And when I watch how Satan, I was sitting in my little quiet place, and I really began to talk to God and say, Lord, I'm, what's going on? You know, I, I, I had a hedge that was around us, so protected, so flourishing. And it's like the hedge is gone. And it just feels like the devil was on a leash, but now he's been loosed. And now he's running rampant and trying to literally kill us. And God is trying to communicate, son, you need to pray more. You see, in the last days in Revelation 13, it talks about a time where no buy, no sell, none of these things, which means almost every single right, every privilege we have is taken away, right? I want you to go to Job 1. I want to, I want to show you something. Job chapter 1. If you hold to this message, I must give you a reality of what will come. You see, the more that we really begin to live by the standards and the principles of the gospel, you better believe that some newfound persecution and newfound trials are going to come in your life. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Definitive statements. It is not maybe if and or possibly. The Bible is very clear. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's very clear. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12. It's very, very clear. And so what God is saying is, is when you and I enlist, this is, this is why love must be that motive. You see, like I told you, the early apostles, when they followed Jesus, it was love that motivated them. It had to be because they knew what they were getting into. They knew if we profess Christ living under Roman dominion, we understand that us and our homes could be burnt down. And that's why it wasn't a game to call themselves Christian. Today, it's easy to call ourselves Christian because they'll say, oh, they're just like them right-wing Republicans. They're like those folks that's just making a lot of noise on Fox News or some other channel and not really having any true religious impact. They just say a lot of stuff. But let us start carrying a message that starts changing hearts and changing churches and changing communities. Let us start carrying a message that actually is bringing about change. Public enemy, number one. If you just make noise, nobody cares. You're just making noise, who cares? You start doing impactful ministry, we start hitting up Sacramento and people start changing. Whole communities are literally starting to follow God, keep his commandments, turning away from sin and turning unto righteousness. Public enemy number one. And so I think there's some lessons from Job that we need to get in closing out this message. 
The Bible says in Job 1 and verse 1, and if you're there, say amen. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. How did God look at Job? Perfect and upright. Fears God, hates evil. Did Job know this? No, he did not. Keep your finger here on Job 1, go to Job 9. Job did not know this. Job did not know that God saw him like this. Oh, by the way, this is how Job was before God. But nevertheless, look at what Job 9 says. In Job 9 and verse 20, the Bible says this. Job 9 and verse 20. This is Job talking. If I justify myself, mine own mouth shall do what? Condemn me. If I say I am perfect, now didn't God say he was perfect? But what's the difference? It was God that said it. Job is now talking about what he says. Job says, if I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. You see, we don't need to be afraid of the message of victory over sin. We don't need to be afraid of the message of Christian perfection. We don't need to be afraid of any of that. We just need to remember it's God that calls it, not you, not me. God's people will reach a standard of perfection, of reflecting the character of Christ fully. God's people, before Christ comes, will reach a place where they have total, complete, and ample victory over all their sins. But we will not be the ones saying, I have arrived. It's God that says that. So let's go back to Job 1. What I really found to be interesting about Job 1 is the Bible says this next. Continuing now in uh, verse 6 of Job 1, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Satan knew that that's language of dominion. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's a language of dominion. Can you just walk into somebody else, else's country and just walk around and just have your own way? We need to show that we got permission and rights to be from one country to another country. Isn't that right? That's the world we live in. But God is talking about the whole earth, and he's saying, where are you coming from? And he said, well, I'm coming from the earth. Walking to and fro in it and walking up and down in it. Satan was indicating his dominion over it. I own this planet. The people on this planet do what I say. And that's why God says, really? Well, let's go ahead and let's take a look at verse 7. Here's how God responds. And the Lord said unto Satan, whence comest thou? Then Satan answered, the Lord said from to, you know, answered the Lord from going to and from the earth. Verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, have you considered my servant Job? That there's none like him in the earth? A perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and issues evil. And then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Now watch this. Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. You see, the things that amazes me about this story is God and Satan having a dialogue about Job? Yes. Was Job aware of it? So Job is living in his prosperity. He's just living in his blessings, getting up every morning and blessing his children, praying for them just in case they might have done something wrong. Job is enjoying his lovely bride and his bride is loving him. Job is obviously appreciative of the wealth that the Lord has blessed him with. And I would imagine he's using the wealth very judiciously. Job is just living life. He's living in the blessings. But Satan comes along and says, listen, man, the only reason Job is doing all this and following you and worshiping you is because that hedge you put around him. Remove the hedge. I guarantee you. Blank. Put your name in there. Remove the hedge. And I guarantee you. 
they will curse you to your face. The reason that I know that Job's experience is a precursor to the experience of God's people for the final crisis right before the second coming is because Revelation 13 says a time will come where there's no buy, no sell, and none of these things, right? So that means that all earthly support is cut off. That means that all of these things are now in the hands of the enemy, right? Well, look at what the Bible says in verse 17 of the same book and chapter, Job 1. It says, and the Lord said unto Satan, behold, how much? All that he has is in your power. Only thing is you can't kill him. Don't touch him. So now, here it is, God gave Satan permission to touch everything. To touch everything Job has. Just don't touch Job. And Job had no idea this conversation is going on. In the last days of Earth's history, what are God's people going to go through? We're going to go to a time where we're going to lose everything that we have. And God says, I'm going to have a people that's still going to keep my commandments. I'm going to have a people that's still going to have the faith of Jesus. I'm going to have a people that's going to prove that they are not worshiping me and they are not serving me because of any rewards that they can get. They're serving me and they're worshiping me because of who I am. That was the same test that was given to those thousands. Jesus told them, the only reason you're following me is because of the fishes and the loaves. You don't really know who I am yet. That was my point. And somehow, sometimes, people come to church just for fanfare. They're focused on just what they can get. Rather than, let me come to church so I can see what I can give. What we don't realize, beloved, is right now, we actually, by way of our decisions, we're already preparing either for the mark of the beast or the seal of God. It's the decisions we're making. It's the decision patterns that we're making. And God is trying to say, family, number one, hold to the message, give the message, regardless of how people feel about it. And let the love of Christ be your chief motivation. But understand that if you give this message and if you stand for me and if you embrace my words, remember Jesus also says, as I allowed what happened to Job, one day I will allow to happen to you. We're told in the little book, Great Controversy, page 618, paragraph 3. As Satan accuses the people of God on account of their sins, the Lord permits him to try them to the uttermost. Their confidence in God, their faith and firmness will be severely tested. This is yours and my future if it's not our present. If this is not our present right now, this is definitely going to be our future. Nobody is going to get into the kingdom without battle scars. You can't enjoy your smooth skin all the time. You're going to have to suffer some cuts. You're going to have to suffer some bruises. We're going to have to realize that Jesus is worth it. And if you don't see that now, then you need to keep studying with him and spending time with him until you see that he's worth it. But it says, as Satan accuses the people of God on account of their sins, the Lord permits him to try them to the uttermost. Is there anybody in this room that you feel like you're being tried to the uttermost? You feel like God is, you feel like the devil is stretching you. You feel like you're getting ready to pop. You're crying out to God saying, Lord, I can't take this anymore. It says their confidence in God their faith and firmness will be severely tested. There's some of us who are going through that right now. I promise you I'm going through it. Your faith and your firmness in God is being, it's not being tested. It's being severely tested. It says, as they review the, the past, their hopes sink. For in their whole lives, they can see little good. On my drive here, my friend Damien, He's telling me all these kind words. You know, D, I, I see that you're blessed, and I see this, and I see that. And he's saying all these very, very kind words to me. I said, man, D, I said, I, I, I wish I could see what you see. I said, I just wish I could see what you see. I don't see what you see. He just felt God called him to go ahead and give a word of encouragement. I appreciate it. 
As they review the past, their hopes sink, for in their whole lives they can see little good. They are fully conscious of their weakness and the unworthiness. Satan endeavors, listen to this, Satan endeavors to terrify them with the thought that their cases are hopeless. Is there anybody in this room that sometimes the devil is pouring it on so thick on you that you begin to say, maybe, maybe God can do it for others. But it's not working for me. Satan endeavors to terrify them with the thought that their cases are hopeless, that the stain of their defilement will never be washed away. He hopes so to destroy their faith that they will yield to his temptations and turn from their allegiance to God. Great Controversy 618, paragraph 3. Some of us are facing trials. Some of us will face trials. As a result of pledging our allegiance to God, as a result of saying, I will be faithful even unto death by your grace, Lord, because of the fact that we choose to hold on and we choose to let the Lord's will be done and we choose to press forward and go forward regardless of how others may think or feel or respond. When we do that, God says, just remember, it's going to invoke even the wrath of the enemy. But as far as we read, was Job letting loose? Was, was Satan let loose on Job? Yes. Was it because of how wicked Job was? No, it was in fact because of something God saw in Job that Job did not see in himself. I wonder if maybe God is allowing some of us to go through some of the things we're going through. Because while we are thinking of ourselves so bad, so terrible, so wicked and so unworthy. God says, actually, you're not far from the kingdom. Could it be that God is actually communicating to some of us saying, actually, I'm more happy with you than you even know. God says, I see you fighting every day. God says, I see your heart's desire to be honest and faithful even in the smallest of things. God says, you seek to honor me with your life. And yes, you fall, but you keep getting back up. And God begins to look at you and he begins to look at me and he begins to say, I'd like to recommend that you stop entertaining the thoughts of Satan. Because God says, when I look at you, I see the apple of my eye. I see someone worth dying for again and again and again. And the Lord begins to give this message of hope to let us know you're more precious than you realize. Because Jesus says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Jesus says, I want you to cast all your cares upon me because guess what? I care for you. The Bible says your father in heaven loves you. And so some of us are going through a lot and it's often because we're trying to honor God. It's just that the devil keeps getting an advantage of us. And what we need to learn is how to not let him do that anymore. But the purpose of this study is to let us know that God wants to bring you and I into the John 6 experience. It's the, inev it's the inevitable experience to all of the faithful. As long as we hold on to the Lord, beloved, and as long as we choose to do his will, and I'm telling you right now, it will invoke sometimes the wrath of a spouse. It can invoke opposition from family members. It can cause fellow church members to become uncomfortable. It can cause friends and co-workers and business partners to rethink their covenant with you. Everybody who makes it into the kingdom is going to have battle scars. Nobody comes out of this wound free. Jesus makes it very clear, we must suffer wounds. But he's the bomb in Gilead that knows how to heal our wounds. He knows how to minister to us. And so my encouragement to all of you is 
hold on. Don't lose your faith. Don't lose your firmness. I see what Satan is doing. He's attacking all of us in different ways, and he's trying to take us out. He's trying to lull us into a carnal state of security. He's trying to get us to fall asleep, and that we'll stay asleep just long enough until, like those foolish virgins, when we wake up, it'll be too late. But God is trying to tell each and every one of you, if you make a decision to go all the way with him, to follow him, and I don't have any good news to tell you of the very immediate future. This world is bad and it's going to get worse. The church is in trouble and it's going to get worse. But in the end, God wins. In the end, the lamb wins. And God will have a people that will prevail because we crown Jesus Lord of Lord and King of King of our lives. And we have learned to put Christ first, last, and best in our life. And I'm told in the precious little book, Messages to Young People, that when we put Jesus first, last, and best in our life, guess what happens? It says we become the happiest people in the world. And so my encouragement to you is do not be afraid of the John 6 experience. Be prepared for it. And the way that we prepare for it is what we've been learning all these weeks and months. That real communion with God. That making sacrifice to spend time with him in prayer. Spending time with him in his words. I understand it sounds like a broken record, but it sounds like that because we're not doing it. But when we start doing it, it's not going to sound like a broken record. We're going to be smiling and saying, amen. That's right. I did it yesterday. Yeah, that was good. Say it again, brother. It's going to have a whole different impact on us when we're doing it. It's only annoying when we keep hearing it, but we don't do it. Amen. We start doing it, man, we're going to say, say it again, preacher. Say it again, because I testify that I did it, and I see the power in it. Say it again. We'll have no problem hearing it again and again and again. But I want to encourage each and every one of you. You embrace your John 6 experience. And you remember that even when that heat gets turned up and the fire turns on and you feel like you can't handle it, don't always look at it as Brother Wallace shared with us last weekend. Don't always look at it as I'm going through this because I'm so bad. Maybe you're going through it because in the eyes of God, you're that good and you're that much worthy for it. Begin to counter the privilege to suffer, even for Christ's sake. Question, how many of us understood our study today? Did we understand it? Is it your desire? I really want to, I'm appealing to your heart, family. Is there any of us today that says, you know what? I've been in the heat of my trials. I've been in the heat of my battles, and I've been losing my faith. I've been losing my faith. I, my faith has become weaker. I, my firmness in God is not as strong. Maybe you feel like you're in some type of spiritual stupor, and you don't even know how to fight. It's like you can't even see the enemy, so you don't even know the target to hit. And you're saying, preacher, I want you to pray for me that God will help me to regain my focus, to regain my bearings. And like Job, adopt an attitude of, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. If there's one person in this room that says, yep, that's me, would you stand to your feet with me? I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. You're going to need prayer. It's a very serious battle that we're in. And the devil plays to keep and he wants to do everything possible to tear us apart, to destroy us. That's why you're standing, family. You fight for your faith. You keep fighting. You never stop fighting. We'll get all our rest when we die. But right now, we got to fight. And we got to be strong in the Lord. You've got to stop entertaining those voices from the enemy that keep speaking to us and telling us the opposite of the truth of what God is really trying to communicate to us. You are special. You are worth it. And that's the reason why the devil has not consumed you yet, because God's hedge is still around you. He's still protecting you. And while you're hearing this voice telling you you're a loser, there's another voice that's letting you know, no, you are not. You're precious. You're special. And you're worth fighting for. And I want you to pay more attention to the latter voice. You're worth fighting for. 
And I know that God will bless you even beyond your expectations. Let us all stand as we close with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, so much for reminding us that while we have such a good news message, a message filled with so much hope, we live in a world that has not accepted this message. And Lord, this message of good news will frustrate others. But let that not intimidate us. Let us go forward to tell the people the whole story of the gospel nevertheless. Help us to keep looking for even that one sinner that would repent and cause all heaven to rejoice. I pray your blessings upon this effort next week as they go out to give the precious little book for this time, The Great Controversy. I ask you, Lord God, to anoint every soldier, every worker of the gospel that will go forward, that the love of Christ will be communicated through their smiles and through their countenances as they share this precious book. But Lord, help us to be an epistle, a living epistle, known and read of all men, that they may see the gospel working out its way in our hearts. And I pray for everyone who took that stand, realizing their faith is being shaken, their firmness is being challenged. But Lord, they're crying out to you. Thank you for allowing us to go through these trials. Thank you for letting us see there's something special in us, something that you want to perfect. Lord, help us not to give up, but to keep pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And I pray may we all come out shining like gold, even after that, which reflects the similitude of a palace. Bless us, your people, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Mm -hmm.